we acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. We recognise their strength and resilience and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. I'd like to extend a big warm welcome to Anna George. Anna's the author of three novels, What Came Before, The Lone Child and Tipping, which is this one just here. She's worked in the legal world as well as in film and television industries and her first novel, What Came Before, was shortlisted for the 2015 Ned Kelly and Sisters in Crime Best Debut Fiction Awards and was long listed for the International Dublin Literary Awards in 2016. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much because I want to leave some stuff for Anna to talk about. So I'm just going to hand it over to you now, Anna. Thanks, Thanks Cathy. And welcome everyone today. Um, I'll talk to you about my third book, Tipping, which is a bit of a departure for me. So Tipping is a story about an overwhelmed and rushing mum of three school-aged sons who reaches tipping point one day when her husband accidentally locks her in the family car. Uh, and he does this when he's on the way and she's on the way to meet the principal of her boys' school because one of her boys, who's a teenager, who's 14, has been involved in a sexting scandal. So after this moment, Liv Winston, my main character, decides she's hasn't, she has had enough and things need to change. So she goes home and she writes a monster list of everything she does around the house and she encourages her three sons and her husband to do the same thing and then she compares lists and lo and behold hers is nine pages long with 322 items and theirs are significantly shorter. So after this moment she delegates tasks at home and her family pick up some chores and her husband also has to change and have a good look at the way he's constructed his life because it's not working for them. It's not matching their values and what she thought they'd agreed when they began this process together. So Tipping's a story about making small changes to your home life as well as to yourself because Liv decides to change how she interacts with people in the world too to be more effective and to perhaps not um, be taken for granted because she certainly felt taken for granted locked in that car. So Tipping's a departure for me. I did write about as mentioned before by Kathy, my first book was about a husband who strangles his wife. So it was about domestic abuse. And my second book was called The Lone Child. And that's about um, neglected children and lonely um, motherhood. Um, and I decided with this book, I wanted to mix things up and change what I was doing. So I move away from those darker topics into something lighter, um, more optimistic and hopeful like raising teenagers and marriage in midlife and gender equality. Nice, lightweight, fluffy topics that I could um, play around with. So tipping is all about the power of tweaks, as I said. And it was inspired by um, a number of real life events, some of them very close to home, some of them a little bit further away from me. One in particular, one of my really special friends came and told me one day about her husband accidentally locking her in the car at basketball the day before which was a little bit dreadful, but also very funny in the way she told it. And I could just imagine creating a character who finds herself in that situation. Now, in defense of my friend's husband, he was rushing off to coach their son's basketball team. And we all know how important under 10 basketball is. So he ultimately was roused by a passerby and she was saved from that car. So that became chapter one of tipping a really nice framing device to Put my character in this dreadful situation and begin the story. Tipping's also been inspired by a couple of um, events at schools um, and I should go back a step in relation to what came before after I wrote that book people would come up to me and say what can we do to make sure we don't have our young boys grow into men like Dave who goes on to strangle his wife and be emotionally abusive which is a really good question and I'm raising sons too and it was on my mind what can we do to raise emotionally intelligent, emotionally literate, respectful, rounded, functional young men today who don't go out and do some of the things that we're reading about in the papers, again, coming out of the Chanel Contos um, petition in Sydney and um, Melbourne, the stories of what schoolboys and old school boys uh, are getting up to in terms of sexual assault and rape. How do we not create men that go on to do that or boys that go on to do that? I thought that's a really good question. So I wanted to think about that and set a story that tries to answer that to an extent. So that's why I set a story with three sons and they're nine and 14-year-old twins. 
And I've also set a story at a school because I thought, obviously, if we want to educate people around how to be and the best way to be and to interact with each other respectfully, we can look at what happens at schools. So, again, very relevant to what's happening in the moment in the press with all this talk about consent education and what we need to do to change the way young people are being um, taught how to be in relation to each other. So I put that in my book. I wanted to do it in a fun and light way to try and cut through, I guess, because these issues have been around for a long time. So I was inspired as I was wandering around thinking, how am I going to write the story about a school and a family and what happens? What can I do? Came across the story in my local world, um, a boys' private school, where two of the schoolboys created a dodgy Instagram account. Um, you probably know the type that have been in the press. They, they pop up every so often. Um, they put pictures of girls that they knew or some they didn't, generally girls on, at the bus stop walking home, put pictures up there and wrote horrible sexualizing slurs about the girls. The word slut was thrown around a fair bit and they invited their peers to rate the girls' books. Now, people cottoned onto this account pretty quickly and it was pulled down, but there was furor in the local community about it, as you can imagine particularly from the girls' mums. And one of those girls' mums wrote about it on a Facebook neighbourhood hub page um, and was very vocal in her outrage and very passionate. And I was sympathetic to her position. Um, and she got a lot of support online, but she also got trolled. And she was called up and telephoned by one of the old boys from this school who effectively, I think, was telling her to pull her head in. And there were some in the community, community who were defending the boys and saying, you know, boys will be boys. Um, this is just a joke. You've taken it too far. Um, don't throw the book at them. And others were saying this is an anti-elite reaction where they're at this elite private school and there's an us and them thing happening and they're just jealous of what we've got and so that's why they're really coming down on these boys. I thought it was fascinating all the different reactions of the people in the community that I was sort of reading about or glimpsing or hearing. I could just imagine my way into a coffee morning where the mums of the girls were over here and the mums of the boys were over there and what that might be like. So I thought, okay, there's the beginning of my book. I've got Liv locked in her car, but then I've got this sexting scandal that will begin the conversation of the book around gender and around the expectations on boys and girls and how they treat each other and what we can do about it. But then I needed the next bit of the book. So, again, uh, I was following, um, following news stories and looking at um, what goes on in the local communities again at schools, and there was a story of a private school where a boys private school this time the deputy head got in trouble not the boys but the deputy head at the school he gave one of the boys a haircut and you may have um, read about this I uh, know it's in a, it's a Melbourne private school but he gave one of the boys a haircut at school because the boy's hair didn't comply with the uniform code and it was photograph day so the, the boys were about to be photographed so he gave a haircut to one of the boys in line this was filmed and uploaded and people weren't happy about it um, and the man actually lost his job fairly swiftly. But what happened was the boys and the parents at that school actually really loved this um, teacher, this deputy head. He'd been at the school for 30 years, I think. Uh, and there was an outpouring of support for him, even though he'd done the wrong thing, really. It was something he'd done over the years, but I think the climate had changed and it wasn't appropriate anymore for someone to rock up and just give a boy, a teacher to give a boy a haircut without permission and um, in that manner. But the school community rallied about around this man because he'd lost his job. The boys became activists. They staged sit-ins and boycotted classes. They had town hall type meetings. There were placards everywhere. They had a big meeting one night and there, there's a, a, a bus or a truck driving around with big placards of the pictures of the deputy head and the relatively newer principal who it transpires wasn't as popular as this deputy head. And what happened was this haircut revealed these deeper tensions at the school because there had been conflict at the school over the new guard and the old guard and the deputy head represented the old guard and the newer principal, the new guard. And the board and the people that ran the school, the old boys, they all had strong opinions about what was happening at the school, but this haircut brought it all to the fore. And as a result, the deputy head actually got his job back after these protests and rallies and there was sort of an independent investigation into what had happened and what was appropriate. His job was given back to him. And a couple of months later, the relatively newer principal quietly left the school. So I thought it was fascinating that this haircut, which was in the press and people were talking about it, um, had led to this sort of substantial change at the school, which had been sort of brewing but hadn't come to a head. So I'm really interested in the idea of tipping points, that moment after which everything changes and things can happen quite quickly. Found that really fascinating. And also as a footnote to that story, 
I think there were historical sexual assault allegations that were outstanding um, against a teacher, a former teacher at that school who had, I think, since deceased, but the school hadn't resolved that matter. That didn't get resolved. That didn't get the energy and the attention that it's haircut and the tensions between um, the old guard and the new guard got. So I wanted to play around with the idea of tweaks, these small changes that can be impactful in your life, which is what Liv finds in her home life, and the idea of tipping points. And sometimes a tipping point can come about from a tweak, from a very small change. So I thought that was really exciting because sometimes we can be overwhelmed by our sense of how much is wrong in the world and how much needs to be done, but it can actually be effective sometimes with a small change. And that small change could actually be a triggering moment in a positive way for a really substantial change. So that's why I put these two stories together and I had a bit more meat on my, my journey through the school of what happens. But there was another school as well that inspired tipping and a completely different type of school. This school was Harvard Business School. And in the course of my research, I stumbled across this fantastic information about what happened at Harvard Business School about 10 years ago when they realized they had a gender equality problem in that these really smart men and women from around the world would go to Harvard to do their MBAs and they um, would spend two years there. And during the course of the two years, at the end of the two years, the men had far better results than the women did generally. They were winning the prestigious prizes at the end of the year in greater numbers than the women were. And they actually were having a better time at, this, at the campus. So Harvard understood there was a problem and it wanted to figure out what it was. So it put, um, it gathered its data and the leaders tried to understand by watching the teaching, getting feedback from the staff um, and understand where the breakdowns were happening. And what they found was that the, the participation, the classroom participation was a really significant or a significant part of the grades that people were awarded. And this was where men tended to be dominating. These young men, you know, typically your banking, your finance, very confident young men were dominating the classroom discussions and the women weren't participating to the same extent. And when women were participating, sometimes it was being forgotten or overlooked by the people who were grading them by the faculty staff. So they also found that these young men were writing notes about the women in classes if they were 14, sexualizing, you know, looks rating notes about the people sitting around them, which would have an effect on behavior of the women in the class. So they did a number of things to try and address what was happening. They put note takers in the back of every class to, to write down exactly what was happening. So this could be presented to the staff and they could see exactly who said what and when. They coached the teachers because some of the teachers weren't being effective in their teaching as far as the students were concerned. They coached them on how to teach more effectively, particularly the younger female staff who themselves didn't feel like they were being respected. They coached them on how to do it in a more effective manner. And they coached these young women, some of them are very smart, international de debating champion type people. They coached them on how to raise their hands as if they were in preschool or, or perhaps kindergarten um, because I think that what they were really saying there, what the leaders were saying was, we expect you to take up space in the classroom and you have permission to take up that space. So you need to raise your hand and mean it like you want to be seen in this context because this is what we need from you. They also broke the classes up into smaller groups because women were more comfortable speaking in smaller groups than in the bigger group. And what they found was, uh, having introduced a raft of changes, that within two years, quite quickly, the culture of the school changed. So the young, the, the gender grade gap narrowed. Women were receiving those prestigious prizes in greater numbers than they had been. And both men and women had a better time at the school. It was a palpable shift in the mood of the culture. Now, it's not completely fixed there. It's, it's still an ongoing process and not everyone was happy about what happened. Some of these young men said they hadn't signed up to be part of a social experiment. They hadn't intended to become guinea pigs and it was the worst two years of their life. I thought that was all rather fascinating and I was thrilled that these um, changes could be made which were effective and shift culture. And that led me down a path of learning about this thing called behavioural design. The bottom line of that is in order to change people's behaviour, we don't need to sit down and convince everyone to change their behaviour. We can change the environment they're in and their behaviour will change. We can make smart, targeted changes to environment, to processes, even to a document, and it will change the behaviour of the people affected by that without them needing to be convinced or in any way. Um, their mind doesn't need to be de-biased. It doesn't need to be on board. 
Um, an example of behavioural design in a way is um, neighbourhoods where you have lots of derelict houses and lots of abandoned lots and there was gun crime in these neighbourhoods in the US. And so they did a study and thought, what if we target certain neighbourhoods and clean up these abandoned lots, these abandoned houses, derelict houses, board them up, put in gardens, change the physical environment? Will that change what happens there? And, of course, it did. Gun crime, gun crime reduced in those areas because the environment's changed, so the behaviour in the environment's changed. So it's that idea that graffiti and dereliction, you know, allows people to think they can behave in a certain way, but you change that and you change the behaviour of people. So I was really excited by that, really fascinated by the potential of behavioural design and kind of wanted to put that in my book and have some fun with it. An example of behavioural design that was effective in terms of gender equality or inequality is um, quite a well-known example from the 70s in the US again. The top five professional orchestras at that time had 5% of their musicians as women. And this was recognised as a problem because they were missing out on a great load of very talented musicians out there being female musicians. So they designed a really simple intervention and that was that people would audition to get into these orchestras behind a screen, blind auditions. So you use your ears and not your eyes when you're auditioning. And what they found was really quickly the number of women that progressed from round one to round two in the audition process was increased by 50%. And today almost 40% of those orchestras are populated by women. So, sorry, almost... 40% of the musicians in those orchestras are women. So I find that sort of stuff fantastic, fascinating, really um, inspiring because things can be done and it doesn't have to be a laborious and long process. Lots and lots of men and women around the world agree that men and women should be treated equally and have equal respect, but then that doesn't get translated into action. And I read this stunning book, which I'll give a plug to here, it's called What Works by Iris Bonet. She's at Harvard herself at Harvard Kennedy School. It's a brilliant book and it's all about gender equality by design. So I found this book a bit late in the writing of my, my book, but it dovetailed in really beautifully with what I'd already started doing and playing around with. Years ago, I read a book called The Tipping Point, which also by Malcolm Gladwell um, gave me some raw material to play with with my book. Um, Iris Bonnet talks about the incredible power of role models um, for women and girls, that idea that you can't be what you can't see. So the more visible, the more um, accessible females in positions of power and leadership, um, the more influential they are. And she even gives examples in her book of research that found that people about to give a talk were affected by the screensavers on a computer that they must have glimpsed on their way to give a talk. And the people that were affected were the women. And the women were affected by the images they saw on the screens. And there were three images. One was Hillary Clinton, one was Angela Merkel, and one was Bill Clinton. And the women that glimpsed the images of the women as they walked off to give a talk gave speeches that were longer and more confident as judged by the women themselves who gave the talk and by the people who some of the evaluators watching. Men who walked past these images on a screensaver were unaffected by who was there, whether it was Bill or Hillary, it didn't matter. But women were actually affected on a quick and unconscious level by a glimpsing a leader like that or a powerful person, a powerful woman. So behavioural design is all about under people who understand how the mind works, learning how to design targeted interventions and environments to affect behaviour to achieve a certain outcome. And so I thought that was just fascinating that there are so many tools at our disposal to use to affect behaviour towards this outcome of gender equality. So I put some of these things in my novel. I already had some of them. Like I already kind of thought around the idea of what you see on walls of schools and you see portraits typically of leaders, ex-heads of the school. And the school I've created, which is a co-ed school, you look around and all you see are leaders who were men, chairman of the board, former principals, deputy principals, and in a, particularly in a co-ed school, but I think actually in single-sex boys' schools as well, there needs to be a lot of images of strong, powerful women and women in all facets of life, sportswomen, uh, political figures, scientists, boys at schools who aren't exposed to women a lot need to see them everywhere to understand women have many facets. They're not just sexual objects that you can do with what you want on a Saturday night when they're 
drunk or you're drunk or whatever or they're sober it's not on so the more we expose people to the full range of women um the better so that's why in my book i had a moment where one of the characters realizes oh my god all i can see are all these men on the walls where are the women where are the women where are the women leaders where are the women on the walls where are the role models for these girls and boys at this school so that's why my book touches on this behavioural design and that's kind of the meat of what happens at the school. I didn't want to write a book like Dead Poet Society or some of those fantastic books where one teacher comes in and through the relationship and the teaching changes the culture of the school or the culture of the class. I wanted to have something lateral and creative and then I found this behavioural design and it was just an aha moment in the writing of my book. Now I've got the meat on my story of change and what can happen and how it can happen. And it's creative stuff and it's fun. Um, and there's so many insights and learning in psychology and behavioral economics that you can, you can use, you know, it's all there, it's research and these things have been seen to work. So we just need to pick them up and use them. And that's why Iris Bonnet's written this book. So we can get these insights that are in these fields and you use them in the real world. She's got lots of examples there and what to do. I've put some in my book. So Tipping's ultimately a book that's meant to be fun and optimistic about the power of tweaks, tipping points, behavioural design, and sort of domestic activism, this idea that my female character, my mum, my wife, Liv, um, she makes change at home by a, creating a targeted course of action to create change and get greater equity and balance at home. She inspires her husband to do the same. And then he has a look at his workplace and his workplace then goes through a process of change inspired by Liv and her tweaks and by behavioural design. And so he ends up moving into a different place too because it's not just about women, it's about the role of men in society too and the, the load of the financial load falling squarely on men very often um, and the load that that brings to bear on them and whether they're actually living the life they want to be living and having the balance in, the, in their life that they need. So it has... Liv's course of action and her kind of crusade has unexpected consequences for her and her marriage as time goes on and her family's life in all different ways. So I hope ultimately people come to the book and enjoy the read. It is meant to be fun and optimistic, lighthearted um, and playful, it certainly is in its tone. But I hope also you're inspired to see your life through fresh eyes and perhaps to make some tweaks and to consider the possibility that any one of us could be responsible for a tipping point at any moment. You know, any one of us could be the person with the scissors doing that haircut. I'm sure he didn't expect that moment, that head deputy head, to have the consequences that it had. So any of us are capable of those moments. You just don't know, which is a very sort of inspiring and optimistic way to view the possibilities. So thanks for coming, Chris, and those others who are watching. Um, I'd love to take some questions if you have any for me your writing process and what life is like as an author okay okay all right well I've been I can give you a long answer and a short answer I'll give you the long one I guess I've been writing uh, for about 25 years I quit my day job as a baby lawyer a long time ago which I didn't I didn't enjoy the job at all and I knew I was in the wrong place found a course to study writing and did that and worked part-time and that's pretty much been the model for the last 25 years um, I've had um, a couple of kids in that time and years off here and there. In the last few years, I now write um, sort of solely and I do workshops at libraries and give author talks like this and do sort of the ancillary um, author work around the writing. Um, but generally, this is what I do now. And my writing process is uh, I have two children who are at school. So it's changed because they're a little bit older now. But generally, my writing process is to write when they're at school. They go off to school. Um, it's really great now they actually go off to school by 8 a.m. So I get to the desk really early, which is brilliant. And I just stay here for the day and they get home at 4.30. So I break my day up with domestic chores. Um, my husband also works from home, so we have cups of tea. Um, and I go for a walk and I write. I write and I research. And I tend to write and research and think and read as I go. So that doesn't, I don't like research, stop, and then write. It always is constantly evolving as I, as I go. Um, and my process in terms of my book and how I approach each book, um, I tend to come to an idea sort of like at the moment, I'm sort of open to ideas, which way to go next, but things sort of niggle at me. And then I think, okay, I want to write about this. And then I sort of open myself to what that might look like. And I read around it, start writing and the sort of the 
the meat of it's getting that first draft down, um, which I kind of have to push myself to get into to make it calm and sort of commit in a disciplined way to doing it. Um, but it's really important to write to the end of your first draft. So then you've got something to work with. It's like throwing a big lump of clay and it looks very gnarly and strange. And then, but once you've got that first draft or that clay, then you can shape it and see what it looks like and which bits are interesting. Um, walk around it and pull out the shape of it. And that's what I do in the rewriting. And I rewrite and rewrite and cut and find turning points and kind of find characters that are more interesting um, and craft the book through that rewriting process. Um, and that's it. I have a couple of early readers, one of whom is my husband. Um, but that generally is the process. The first book took 12 years. The second book took three or four. This one's taken about four. So there's a bit yeah. of an overlap with writing and publicity and things like that. But that tends to be the way it works for me. And do you have another one that you're working on at the moment? I do, but it's really early days. So I've only got a couple of chapters um, and I'm in that thinking phase, just thinking um, which way to go, what to do. And I've changed, as I said, I've tweaked my writing style, you know, by introducing humour and a different tone to this book. So I will probably do that again with my next one, I think. I really enjoyed writing this one. It was fun. Um, so I probably will continue with that, yeah. Yeah, so like I told you before we um, before we went live, I have been reading your book and as a mother of two now young men, okay. I felt this was coming from your heart. <laughs> I felt there were aspects of the book where it was like, yeah, she's definitely a mum of boys. Um, yeah, yeah, I can see what's happening. But what I liked about the characters was they didn't feel comfortable speaking up, but they kind of just did it anyway. And there's a character in here that you haven't mentioned yet. You've got Jess's point of view. So it's written by Duncan, um, Jess and, and Liv. So with Jess, it's, it's a different point of view. Do you want to explain kind of why she's in there as a point of view? Sure, that's a good question. I didn't mention Jess. So Jess is the mother of a teenage girl. So I needed that voice of outrage in the beginning who was upset when her girl is involved in this sexting scandal. And I also wanted a different type of mum to live who's very much in her head and reads a lot and, you know, quotes studies a bit like me, I guess. But um, I wanted a counterpoint to that. So someone who's not really interested in reading, doesn't read books. I mean, you do meet as a writer from time to time, people who say they haven't read a book since high school. Uh, Jess is kind of that person who probably didn't even read the books in high school either. So I wanted something completely different, a different type of person, but certainly someone who's very obviously attached to her daughter and very passionate about getting the best for her daughter but also someone who's not great at speaking out and sticking up for herself and is also a bit timid about even uh, challenging her daughter because she doesn't want to upset her. Um, so she doesn't really have a strong voice, Jess, in the beginning in the book. She does put her outrage out there in a moment and then she gets trolled and it's not comfortable for her and she really regrets it. Um, so it's her kind of learning to sit with her voice and feel, take up space um, as a person. Um, but she does have some strength. She's a very good networker and she's kind of key to what happens in the story because of her ability to join people together. But she's there to go through the journey of understanding um, what can be done and becoming more passionate about gender equality and standing up for her daughter. She's probably not someone who's critically thought about that um, in the world until this moment with the sexting scandal and meeting Liv. Um, so she's quite important in the story to round out um, a different mother's perspective. And I thought that it was um, unintentionally, obviously, um, great timing in terms of where the world is at the moment with this discussion on gender equality and, and safety for women um, across the world. There's lots of discussions that are going on. So it's nice to read about it in a less confrontational kind of way. It's it's nice to go, oh, yeah, that, that could so totally happen. Oh, that's me. Yeah, you know, and I like that Duncan is very a very honest character that he doesn't necessarily, he's distanced from his kids by the circumstances of his work. But there was also a point 
in one section I was reading about the younger son and he's like he's such a weird little kid or something like that he he just didn't get him he wasn't sure if he really liked him and um, I thought that's such an honest thing for someone to say about about a child is that, you know, we're, we've got this ideal that we're supposed to like everything about, you know, our children. And sometimes, you know, um, I just liked that it was written that way, that it's honest. It's not that he doesn't love him or anything like that. It's just like he didn't get him. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for those comments. It's true. And the book's about um, bias and it's about tuning into people. So there's bias in the books in terms of obviously the gender bias, there's a little bit of sporting bias going on, a bit of one-eyed sporting mum and one-eyed coaches, but also a bit of bias in the family in terms of a little bit of a favourite son there, a little bit of a not-so-favourite son um, for the characters. And I wanted to sort of talk about that a bit. And also Duncan's not tuned in, as I said at the beginning about being tuned in. He's not really across the emotional life of his children or even his wife particularly. Um, And his journey is sort of learning to sort of sit with, his people and and tune into them a bit better as it is for Jess and her daughter Grace um, and Liv's kind of tuned into one son but not really that tuned into a couple of others so I just wanted to play around with that idea that it's not as straightforward just raising and children are different to each other obviously and that some of them are easier to raise than others in the same family um, and parents have an affinity with one or the other or you, you do love them all but you some are easier at times than others and that can shift too one can be easy for a year or two and then you know another one's um now that one's hard to raise or to help or to connect with so I wanted to look at all of that and I did want to I mean it's a bit exaggerated obviously the family but I wanted Cody he's got these twin brothers and they've got their issues and he's bouncing off the walls because he's got a bit of ADHD. He's sort of a likable kid, but he's a full on kid and he breaks things and he kicks balls into walls over and over again. And so he's the sort of kid that can really get on your nerves if you're not in the mood or you're not probably giving him proper attention and it's just grating around the edges. Um, But they do go on a bit of a journey together, those characters. And I wanted to, to do that. And in terms of it being timely, when I started writing this book, as I said before, it was actually before Me Too. So Me Too happened and I thought, can't write another book that's like everybody else's Me Too story. Um, everyone in the world has a Me Too story on Twitter and everywhere else. They're not even going to need to write a book about it. They've already got it. Um, I'm not going to have much to add now. So I had to sort of abandon that as a concept and as a focus. And it was a bit more serious, I guess. I hadn't got the tone quite right. And so I thought I have to completely shift the lens and look at this from another angle. I, I do have sexting. I do have, it does touch on sexual harassment, but they're not the that's not the what happens in the story in a way. It's the how we deal with that or how did this happen or how do we make sure these kids understand it all. That was the focus of the book. And then, yeah, to now have those very questions in Australia, like the weekend after my book came out, all these principals are writing letters saying, we are it's going to do respectful relationships in a different way and <laughs> we are so into this. I've written that letter in the book. My principal writes that letter. You know, as a result of this incident, we are now bringing in an expert to teach us these things. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, it's so close to home. Um, and I kind of want to send my book to the principals and to the mums associations and parents associations and mothers groups and book clubs, even though it's meant to be light, it still is talking to these issues in a different way, you know. And one of the things that Iris Bonnet says in her book, we've all had diversity training, we've all had this training, it actually isn't working. The training, the talking, it's not getting through. So that's why this behavioural design is so exciting. It's not going to solve it all overnight, but it's certainly a really great tool to use with everything else. You still need to talk. You need to, you will reach some people, but you're not reaching everyone enough through through the training and the, and the talking. So that's why, you know, maybe I will, I don't know, I feel a bit coy about sending it to a bunch of white men principals who might not be uh, up for it, but um, I'd love to. And I'd love anyone watching to um, to, to send it to their school or take it to their school book club, um, take it to their teachers and encourage the teachers to read it because uh, I really would love to get the message out that there are other ways of looking at it as well, extra ways. Yeah, and, I mean, it does come across as this is not a lecture about what you should and shouldn't do or boys are evil or girls are, um, you know, showing inappropriate photos and things like that. It's it's all about a learning process and changing the thought patterns that people have subconsciously as well as consciously. So we can all say, oh, yes, I'm not gender biased or, or whatever, but sometimes you don't even realise, and I like that, I think every single character looks 
at the environment around them and sees with fresh eyes what they're actually, like you mentioned, with the principals, the photos on the walls, but even the girls' bathroom at mm-hmm. at the school, which for those who haven't read it, the girls' bathroom is all pink, pink pretty wallpaper and flowers and mirrors, and the boys' bathroom is just plain um, with no mirrors. So even just little things like that, it means that they're different, It you know, whereas in reality the room has the same purpose. So it shouldn't really be any different. So I really liked it, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, just on the bathrooms, there's actually a really interesting, I think she's called Enlightened Education. I may be getting her name wrong, the business wrong, but um, there's a woman, I think she's in Sydney. I want to say Danielle Miller, but I could be wrong. She has led um, a bit of a campaign to improve bathrooms in in schools around the country. I don't know if you're aware of that, but nice. Um, not to make them frilly and pretty, but she identified having done workshops with girls in schools, which is what she does to kind of empower girls and um, speak to girls' um, self-confidence and self-worth and self-esteem. She's uh, realised that a place that people go and girls go when they're upset, lonely, bullied is the bathroom, and that's not a very nice place generally in schools. It can be at worst, it can be smelly and dirty, and uh, otherwise it can be bare and unfriendly. And so she's led a bit of a campaign for schools to revamp their bathrooms to make them places of positivity and nurturing and fun. Um, and she had interior designers come and help to design some changes for bathrooms to show other schools what's possible. And that is that is behavioural design. You know, they've got sayings on the walls, you know, smile, you're not alone, or, you know, positive messages around an environment they've painted with trees and palm trees and completely changed the feel of the space to make people feel better, so to change the behaviour. So you don't go in there and feel lonely and sad anymore. You go in there and feel, yeah, this is a place where I can feel better after I leave here, um, even if I'm on my own. So, you know, lots of people are doing this stuff in different ways um, around the world. I just would love people in, in Canberra, in power, to be aware of what can be done to change the environment um, and to change behaviour through changing the environment. And with that one, did they did they decorate the boys' toilets in the similar it's a good way. question. I was wondering that as you said that. I think it's a campaign about girls. I think I think this particular person's particularly focused on girls. Um, so the examples I saw through her website were just girls' schools. Oh, yeah. so it's just a girls' school anyway. Yeah. So it yeah. doesn't, it no, doesn't have that comparison. No. <laughs> it's not yeah. excluding them. It's just, yeah. Um, ask about was your legal career there is a bit of legal speak going on in there do you think it's kind of influenced it uh look I think it has a little bit obviously writers tend to write about what they know and so I worked briefly in the law full-time as a young person and then I've worked part-time over the years in bits and pieces to support my writing um I didn't particularly like it and that does come out in my writing my first character was a jaded lawyer who strangles his wife so you know he's not a good ad for the legal profession and in this case, Duncan's the, the lawyer and the partner and he's, you know, in his own way, I suppose, heading towards burnout from just being overworked and but it's a fairly unforgiving culture. Um, I went back and interviewed a couple of friends who are still in the law who I went through with and I don't know that it's changed a great deal, really. I mean, there's lots of talk around how it's different now, but I'm not sure that it's ultimately that different. It's a very difficult, difficult environment to thrive in, demands a lot of you. And uh, I wanted to put that in the book. So Duncan grapples with that. And a lot of people, well, I fell into the law. I can't say a lot of people, but I fell into the law because it was something like I was able to get into and it was sort of something to aspire to. And then when I got there, I didn't really love it. Um, And I think that that's not uncommon too. When I left the law, people congratulated me for leaving and said they wished they could leave too, but they didn't know what else to do. And I was lucky because I had something else that I wanted to do. Uh, that was pretty grim and partners said that to me, senior people at that law firm who'd gone all the way up to the top and looked at me wistfully as if they wished they could do it too. So that was really striking because I've, I've left other jobs. I worked in TV as a lawyer and when I left, no one was saying, you know, oh, I wish I could leave too. People were happy in their job generally, you know. So that's something I wanted to talk about, the role of work and 
how we just do things sometimes um, because it's expected of us. And then 20 years later, I think, how did that happen and what have I done? What can I do differently? And also to unpick the material world we live in a little bit. We don't have to live in this big house in this suburb. Um, we, can, we can make changes to our life and live with more integrity and in accordance with our values um, and do more meaningful work or purposeful work. Um, which is what Liv kind of finds herself feeling as she becomes more involved in transforming the school. So um, I definitely do circle back on my legal time. Um, and I think it does help uh, in a way studying law is all about learning to understand language really carefully and precisely. So that does help. Um, but yeah, uh, hopefully maybe I've written the law out of myself now and I won't keep writing characters that work in the law and resign. I think I've written two It works. <laughs> so long as it works for you because there's, there's a scene that I really quite like where Duncan has a light bulb moment and he goes home early and he doesn't um, go to his home office and start working and there's no one else at home and it's kind of like he's at a loose end. He's lost. He doesn't know what to do. and But he was actually quite enjoying it but then he still expected someone to notice and it was like people didn't notice that he was actually around or and doing things so Mm. um yeah definitely a big thing about managing your time and managing your work expectations and things Mm. came across yeah I also cottoned on to this idea when I used to work I worked two days a week um in a in an office in the tv company and I realized I didn't feel fully integrated into the into the firm really I was a lawyer and they were in tv so that didn't help but also I was only there two days a week and I think three days is a sort of more ideal number of time days to be at work because then you do feel like you're in it a bit more and four and five I felt it's way too many days of work (laughs) yeah way too many (laughs) do that but I also thought with Duncan reversing it he's only home two days a week he's five days a week somewhere else so he's not actually in step with his family he's just not there enough and he misses so much of their lives and he feels like particularly he used to travel before COVID um you know, he would be away, he'd come back and he'd left one drama and then there's a totally different drama and he's always just a bit behind the beat in his own family because he's literally not there enough. So he cottons onto this idea of wanting to do things differently in terms of his work in an in a overhaul kind of way. And then one of the challenges in writing the book was um, COVID came along. So he originally wanted to shake up work and work from home. And that was like this radical idea that I thought that he would push at work and say we should work from home and they're like oh it's a ridiculous we can't possibly and then COVID came along and the whole world worked from home and I couldn't have that anymore so yeah. yeah exactly so all of a sudden I had to unpick his story and come up with another idea that was a little bit revolutionary for the workplace um, which is why he, he comes up with another idea but life and writing sometimes they dovetail and sometimes life just completely destroys what you've got in your book <laughs> and you've got to redo it or do it in a different way at the last minute because it's just not going to resonate at all if it's if it's already been done well I mean a global pandemic I mean who saw that coming like you couldn't have seen that coming four years ago so (laughs) not unless you've got a background in medicine or something that we don't know about (laughs) no I definitely don't what I I found from reading about your other books which I haven't actually read yet so I could be totally wrong Mm. was that your books are elements of social commentary um family life and change and it seems to be a consistent a consistent theme um so do you, so you do feel that it is a big leap in your writing style or oh uh, no you're right I mean I think the books are still mine in a way recognizably mine with the same flavors it's just delivered in a different way with this book because the tone in the other books was not um at all sort of dry or sharp it didn't have that um to it and I have moments which make me laugh in this book I don't know if it's going to make anyone else but you know I didn't have that in my other books they were about uh, more serious topics but to- and one was more um it said literary thriller and they placed the bookshops placed it next to Gone Girl but it wasn't it wasn't genre crime fiction but it had crimes in it and it was an intriguing kind of read and the second one was more of mystery and intriguing read as well um whereas this one it, it does feel really different if you see the covers you know, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> bright and happy, and that one's oh, like, on. which way am I going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And if she's got a lipstick smeared across her face, yeah, and it. um, yeah, whereas this one, it's just it's such a cute cover, and um, I saw it in the shops, and it like it stood out because there's not many red 
covered book. So now when people come into the library asking for a book with the red cover, we can go this one, which, believe me, it happens. Page and a paragraph. So this is chapter one, page, well, chapter one, and it's Liv's point of view. 45, married and healthy, Liv Winsome was increasingly dismayed by her lot. Life wasn't as she's imagined it, 20 years, two degrees and three children ago. Only moments earlier, her husband of almost two decades had forgotten her. With a jaunty flick of his wrist, Duncan had clicked his keys at their car behind him. Sitting in the car, finishing a call, Liv had taken a second to understand and try the handle. Then she clambered across to the driver's side window and thumped. She called out. This can't be happening, she thought, pushing buttons. But it was. Duncan and Jay, one of her 14-year-old sons, were dashing towards the office at Carmichael Grammar without her. The morning was getting warmer and the car park full. Sunlight was pouring across the roof of the recently completed wellbeing centre. Other families had already arrived, presumably in their full contingent, to watch their beloveds play sport. Their cars, mostly SUVs, the odds of van, sedan or station wagon, looked in reasonable condition. Probably nothing faulty about any of them, no dodgy latches or hidden defects. Newly bought, the Winsome's car was secondhand, but lux for them. Liv had spent the last few weeks of summer researching, avoiding suspect airbags and dud transmissions. Not one review had mentioned this. Pressed up against the glass, Liv searched beyond the car park to the school's immaculate sports grounds. There, though her, sorry, though her three sons attended Carmichael, she didn't recognise a single sweaty child. She, trialed, she tried Duncan's phone. She tried Jay's phone, but of course it was still off, and she remembered in her handbag. She tried Duncan's again. Often when she rang, her husband's phone was on silent or in a distant pocket. She peered into the brightening sky. Usually she didn't mind Duncan's not answering, but this morning it was getting hot. Children were locked in cars, she thought, not adults, not wives. It just, it's beautiful. Thank you for reading that. It's such a nice way to start the, um, the story and a, and a lovely way to finish your talk today. Um, when I was writing my talks and referring to these books, and this one's called Nudge, a really famous book written by a man who won the Nobel Prize in economics, which kind of, I don't know if it's the defining book perhaps on behavioural design. So it's all about no. these nudges. So um, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. <laughs> if I do research in this way again, I think I will put them in the back of the book somewhere. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of research. We, it, it comes through that you know what you, you know, you yeah. understand what you're trying to express in the book as well too. It's not just like you've just, you know, made it up and it doesn't oh. have any background or depth to it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. I was so excited when I learned about it. I just, uh, it just opened the book up. Thank you so much, Anna, and good luck with the rest of the tour. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank for you. <laughs> See ya.